This episode of Straight Shooter Wrestling Podcast is brought to you by Betwhackers. If you're looking to make some serious money during this year's college football and NFL season, then listen up. Betwhackers is for the betting public who are looking to get an edge on their weekly wagers on college and NFL football. The Betwhackers team will provide you with six weekly picks that their experts have identified to give you a winning edge across both college and NFL football, along with giving you one power slam parlay. With their countless hours of research, the Betwhackers experts have delivered their clients a 56% average win rate in the NFL season and a 63% average win rate in the college football season across the past five years. And if you know anything about gambling, you know that those numbers are absolutely crazy. Just in 2020, the Betwhackers experts delivered a 69% win rate to their clients in the college football season. At that point, that's pretty much a license to print money. And for those really wanting to go above and beyond, their power slam parlays have won at least three times every football season in the last five years, and that's gonna give you three to six times return on your weekly wager. Of course, you can always verify this because all of their win percentages are authenticated by Bet365. As an avid sports gambler myself, I promise you that I'm gonna be using their picks because why use my picks that usually deliver 10 to 15% win rates when I can lock in anywhere from 56 to 70%. Why not, right? And of course, they're providing Straight Shoot listeners with a fantastic promotion. For the first month, Straight Shoot subscribers get a discount of $75 on their membership when they use the promo code SLAM at checkout. Again, that's $75 off when you use the promo code SLAM. And that's creative because we're a wrestling podcast. Sign up by using the Straight Shoot link found on the Betwhackers website. That's www.betwhackers.com. Again, www.betwhackers.com. You will also find the direct link in the description of this video or audio podcast. Thank you very much to Betwhackers for sponsoring Straight Shooter Wrestling Podcast. And now on to the episode. Welcome everybody to Straight Shooter Wrestling Podcast. I'm one half of your host, Santi. And Steve is back. What's up, buddy? Welcome back. Thank you, my friend. I missed you. I actually can say with the cold blackness of my heart, I missed you. I missed you, but... We did have a great fill in and I just want to say right from the start, I want to thank Heel Kev for taking over and uh, putting uh, my shoes on for three weeks and really putting out some great content with you. So Kevin, thank you so much for what you did and we can't wait to have you back on. Yeah, big shout out to Kevin. We'll leave his links down in the description one more time. Um, yeah, I think he did a great job at uh, at carrying the torch while you were gone, but where were you? Let's give people a, a, a brief, I guess, uh, timeline of events of where you've been for the past three and a half weeks. Well, I decided to take a much needed vacation. Uh, and as you can see from the shirt, I was able to go join our fellow, fellow wrestle talkers and the rest of Europe, basically in Cardiff, Wales for clash at the castle and Santi, what an event, what an event they were able to put on. Um, I want to say one thing or a couple of things. First off the people that I met, uh, through Wrestle Talk and through social media uh, at the event. You guys are absolutely awesome. You all know who you were. I'm not going to drop names, but you guys were all fantastic. And thank you for making the event so much more special for me. Um, but I do want to shout out uh, the Straight Shoot fans. Um, Santi, we are, we, we are global. We were recognized left, right, and center. Um, I was stopped in the airport. I was stopped in Cardiff. I was stopped in pubs. I was stopped walking down the street, taking photos with everybody, um, getting stories from people that just really made what you and I do uh, all worth it. And so I just want to shout out all the fans that I was able to meet, take photos with, uh, hear your stories. Thank you so much. Um, and if you guys have those photos, go on to Twitter and post them and make sure you tag us in the uh, in your tweets. Uh, just so we can see them and you know we we lo i love seeing all of you and i just want to say thank you for being so passionate thank you for supporting straight shoot and i guarantee santi and i are going to be putting out so much more content to make this even better and i might have a big surprise coming up in the next couple of weeks so stay tuned to that but santi enough of the schmoozing enough of the getting back into it what's the topic let's go 
Yeah, so, um, I mean, some of the people that watch this podcast, I'd say maybe one or two of them are probably into wrestling news and seeing what's been going on. And if you are one of those people, you may have seen that AEW just scored, um, I would arguably say, one of their biggest gets from um, the former WWE treasure chest. That would be Paige now going by her Twitch name, original name Soraya uh, who just debuted um, not in physical action but did come out to the audience and confronted Britt Baker so immediately being put right into that main event picture as of this moment we don't know if she's back in in ring capabilities we know that Tony Khan is not afraid to put those people right back in the ring like he did with the likes of Daniel Bryan to be fair Daniel Bryan was in the ring in his time at towards the end with WWE um, but this we don't know yet we don't don't know if we're going to have Paige back in the ring, if she's going to be a manager, if she's going to be an authority figure, if she's going to be a valet. We don't know. What I know is that Paige is incredibly valuable in terms of turning that women's division upside down, a women's division that needed a shakeup. In a women's division who may have also just lost one of their major major stars in Thunder Rosa. So this is a major get for All Elite Wrestling. And I'm one, I'm very happy for Paige because it seemed like WWE was never going to be able to let her do what she wanted to do. And two, I'm happy for her Twitch fans because signing with AEW means that she can do Twitch on the side as well. Because for the most part, at the very least, most WWE contracts do not allow for those third-party uh, associations like being on Twitch or Cameo or anything anything like that uh so yeah steve we have soraya in all elite wrestling what are your immediate thoughts santi i'm gonna probably give the biggest hot take and i i'm pretty sure you're gonna agree with me on this aew has just scored the number two free agent on the market in either the men's or women's divisions right now just behind i would say the fiend sure in Bray Wyatt, Zariah is the number one free agent on the market. If she is able to compete, she has just changed the entire AEW women's division for the better. And Tony Khan, I know you are paying her a hell of a lot of money to be there. Do not screw this up because you have gold in your hand she can compete she has proven that since she was 18 years old 19 years old or whenever she debuted in wwe this girl woman is top class i am so excited i am actually drawn a little bit back towards aew on this i am excited for this and i cannot wait to talk the rest of the topic of this show because of this signing so real quick, you know, you mentioned there that, um, you know, I think you alluded to pretty much saying, I hope Tony Khan doesn't screw this up. How do you foresee this being screwed up? Because uh, my immediate thoughts would be the likes of um, Keith Lee throwing a main event caliber um, talent into the tag team pool. A sure tag team champions, but it's like when it comes... No, not anymore. I guess I should clarify. Um, but even then in the tag team division, even when he was the top of the tag team division, he still felt like the fourth or fifth most relevant tag team behind the likes of, of course, the Young Bucks, FTR, um, bringing in the Briscoes to do shows for um, for um, Ring of Honor, Ring of the, Honor the, yeah. the, the, the factions like the, the Blackpool Club, right? So like, there is, he still felt like an afterthought even at the top of the tag team division. The other one that um, scares me and I think might be the one that is probably the most likely would be the Alistair Black treatment where you tell him we're going to do all of this grandiose stuff with you in terms of booking and then none of it actually gets delivered which is the reason why Alistair Black seems to be upset with AEW and is looking for any sort of way to get out of his AEW contract. How, how do you foresee this potentially going wrong well first off santi alistair black is out of his aew contract that came out this earlier earlier this week well news uh, to me and missed that yeah. seriously alistair black is out he said out he sent out a statement um he's ta he's gone away he's he's been re he's out of his aew contract he's gone he's done um and he's f releasing a further statement with um his wife uh zelina 
um in the next in the upcoming weeks so stay tuned to that and we'll definitely be covering that as well um my point being and i agree with what you just said about keith lee uh and alistair black my point on the zariah thing is you have just made her debut and if she's not a wrestler fine then she's gonna team up and be a manager with someone but i just don't see it. you're not gonna bring a name like this in and not have her in the ring especially when you have her confront Britt baker after a match this is not a thing so she is going to come out she is going to compete and this is going to be a huge one sandy but i say she's the one that beats jade cargill too put wow. both title put both titles on her wow. show the women's division what they need tony storm does not have a chance in hell against zariah technically tech skill on the mic and skill in the ring it's night and day give her the roman reigns treatment i am this over on this signing for aew give zariah the roman reigns treatment put all the titles on her and make those girls step up and work because we know how poor that division is make them work for it because if she's able to compete on a limited schedule, it's not like the WWE schedule where she's wrestling 300 days a year. This is a limited schedule, so she's able to put on good shows minimally. Just like uh, MJF said to Ariel Hawani earlier this week on his interview, where he goes, I wrestle twice a month because people are there just to see me for what I am and who I am. Zariah could be the same thing. She doesn't need to wrestle every week. Put both titles on her in two months and then make those girls work for it. Great so booking. People where, will love it. Where would you rank Zariah's signing um, in the pantheon of AEW poaching from wwe or ex wwe talent because um obviously it didn't turn out well but i immediately thinking of names like cm punk obviously moxley jericho all those uh nxt guys that they've taken ty dillinger top five, uh, top five. five? okay yeah if i was to say if i was to ramble them off but we're getting into the topic of the show and we'll, we'll talk about these guys but i will jericho moxley brian soraya adam cole or Alistair Black, depending on which way you want to go with it. But she's in the top five. Easily. I, yeah, no, you, I, I think you agree. I, I agree with you. Um, by the way, I, well, I guess I was going to say, you know what? I disagree in the whole, she's the, the top uh, free agent, but because I was about to say Sasha Banks, but I forgot. She's not technically a free agent. She's just pouty under WWE contract, not a free agent. So um, I, I'll, I'll eat those words before they even come out of my mouth. Anyways, topic of the show. So this got us wondering, okay, you know, this is major. This is, uh, I, I don't know if it's fair to say a major blow to the WWE because they weren't using her in the first place. It might be one of those situations where, um, you know, it's, it's oh, WWE sees another kid playing with their toy and then now they want their toy back. It might be that, but as of right now, we can't really say that this is a major blow to the WWE. Again, they weren't using um, Paige slash Soraya as a talent. So um, it's almost like no harm, no foul to the WWE. That being said, there have been a lot of signings that have been a lot of harm and a lot of foul to the WWE. So today's topic of the show is we're gonna be talking about the most wild, the most impactful defections from WWE to another brand. Now, we are using the word defection loosely where it doesn't necessarily have to be somebody who, you know, back like in the WCW days where you're on television one night and then on WCW the next night. Although that reminds me of somebody that we left off the list that maybe we can start off with because I think like this is the definition of a defection. Uh, but yeah, we're going to be talking about like the most impactful ones. The And it can be it can be that it can be somebody leaving after free agency. Again, we're just being really, really loose with the with the topic. I want to start off with this one because we were talking about it because it's one of the few that he was on the same show on the same night. How yeah. did we forget during the planning to talk about Rick Rude, who <laughs> was on Monday Night Raw on a pre-recorded show and debuting at the same time on Monday Night Nitro? That should have been the first name out of our mouth, Steve. 
Can we talk about this for a second? Imagine this being 2022 with WCW and WWE pre-recording. The internet would have broken. Twitter would have broken. With Rick Rude, I can just see the memes now of just being like <laughs> WTF and both of them on the like side by side within the with the time clock. I can see it now. I don't know how we missed this, Santi. You know what? We we are a fan run podcast, but I'll tell you right now, I don't know how we missed this one. That's we don't have one. producers. I mean, we don't have yeah, yeah, we don't have producers telling me tell like doing the research for us. We're just doing this off the cuff. And I'll tell you right now, how the fuck did we miss Rick Rude? Because that is one of the biggest botches in pro wrestling history on both sides. A hundred percent. It was amazing for WCW and absolutely shocking for WWF. Like yeah. that was yeah, like there's going to be much bigger names that we're going to be talking about, but like in terms of like the proper definition of a defection, you know, something that uh, there's another one that is definitely a defection. And it's another one from the WWE to WCW days uh, on the women's side that that might even be more of a defection. But this is this. This is the type of shit that if you like you said, if you think about it happening in the modern day uh, and for those that don't know, that might be younger. Uh, Rick Rude was a top mid card WWF um, uh, wrestler, part of DX. Um, Original ev- DX. Yeah, everyone loved him. Everyone loved Rick Rude. He's one of those guys where um, even people back then and even people now are just like, man, WWE really dropped the ball on that guy. Like 100%. they had they had gold and they didn't even realize that they had gold. Rick Rude was fucking phenomenal. Um, but because back then WWE Monday Night Raw uh, was pre-recorded, um, uh, WCW always did a lot of shenanigans with that, whether it was revealing the results live on television in order to try and stop people from switching over to the WWF. Um, but in this particular night, this pre-recorded show had Rick Rude on television, on WWF television on Monday Night Raw, while at the same time making his debut on another channel on a rival wrestling promotion for WCW Monday Night, uh, Monday Night Nitro. And that... Dude, imagine, imagine that happening uh, with WWE and AEW or any wrestling promotion. That would be fucking bananas. That would actually break the internet. I'm going to tell you right now, that is the exact reason there is a 90-day non-compete clause now in every WWE contract. No doubt. Because of that segment. 100%. If, if we've got somebody from WWE that watches that, that does the contract, that is the exact reason. And I want you to prove me right, because there is no other reason that that's in there. Just because they never would have thought of that unless it didn't happen. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. Like when we're thinking of the functions, this has to be number one, of course, bigger names. And let's just get to probably the biggest names on this list. Um, the outsiders. Now, you could have the conversation about Hulk Hogan being in this, but that was before, right? With Hulk Hogan, you know, taking that break to make movies and then coming out of retirement and going into, into WCW. That's less of a defection, but maybe a spiritual defection because he was the heart and soul of the WWF for just so long. So we might we, we might bring Hulk Hogan into this conversation, um, but when it comes to... You know, the first shot fired in the Monday Night Wars, I think you can really say that this was it, right? And for those that don't know, the Outsiders are the precursor to the NWO in um, Razor Ramon in WWF going as his 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 actual name scott hall and diesel going now as his original name Kevin Nash appearing on Monday Night Nitro as themselves without acknowledging the fact that they are WCW talent. The storyline here was made to make us, the viewers, believe that this was an invasion from two WWF guys. Yep. And it's kind of funny because I remember this as a kid. Like, I, 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 I know you weren't watching. I don't even think you were old enough at the time. But uh, when I was watching this, I was that kid running up and down the stairs to two different TVs, WCW, WWE. And when Scott Hall, sorry, when Razor Ramon walks up, walks out in denim and just steps over the barricade mid match, you're like, what is going on? Like, I first thing you think is, am I on the wrong channel? Secondly, you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. 
what's going on like why why is this happening and we didn't have dirt really we didn't have dirt sheets back then we didn't have the internet we had what we were seeing is what we got and it was a you've, you've used this term a couple of times it was a benefit and a curse the way Eric Bischoff did this because it made WWE look so powerful that they could get their own guys into WCW. And obviously the lawsuits started to come in after the fact because Razor sounded too much like Razor. And when Kevin Nash debuted, it was literally Kevin Nash and Scott Hall or uh, Diesel and uh, Razor Ramon. You know, they, they made them look so strong that it was almost a negative for the WCW brand. And they did a quick 180 on that and got them to say, yes, we're contracted with WCW now. But that whole like four to five weeks of watching Nitro and being like, we literally have no idea why they are here. Made you as a wrestling fan fully engaged in the product that WCW was putting out. And they were doing it off the WWE name, but at that point in time, that's what they needed. And that's what made Eric Bischoff so successful as the producer back then. But that defection literally changed the landscape of pro wrestling. Like we talk about Rick Rude being like the big one because it's like a comedy meme that he was on two shows at once. But if you want to talk about the defection that changed the business, it was Scott Hall and Kevin Nash. It's this one, 100%. Um, in, in fact, you know, I think you you made a good point there of, um, I do think that it was problematic in a sense to put over, for Eric Bischoff to put over these guys the way that he did um, with, the under, with the underlying uh, understanding that they're still part of the WWE, right? They're part of the, uh, of the competition and they are just so much, they're so powerful, so intimidating, and they're coming here just taking over the show. I think it did make WWE look far too strong. If anything, this might be a precursor as to why the WWE refuses to acknowledge any sort of competition, right? Because, yeah, you, you know, you start to acknowledge the existence of other places. You start to acknowledge the accomplishments done somewhere else. You are raising the stock of another organization while potentially bringing down your own. I, so, I mean, I get it from WWE's perspective. And this was, I, I mean, you can make the argument the first time that that really came into play. Um, the, the other thing as well, you know, you mentioned that this changed the landscape of professional wrestling. It led into arguably five, six years of the most popular faction aside from probably DX um, to grace professional wrestling. Of course, the addition of Hulk Hogan later on down the line really is what catapulted the NWO, but it just goes to show um, just how much of an impact this sort of defection made that um, that turning Hulk Hogan heel, right? The unturnable Hulk Hogan just made sense, right? Yep. A, a move that never made sense. In a, you know, you we can talk about, well, 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 this is my impression of Steve. Uh, Cena should have been heel. I would have liked Cena if he was heel. No one was saying that about Hulk Hogan. I think people were saying that they were tired about the the hokiness of Hulk Hogan, the eat your, uh, how you almost said, eat your prayers, say your prayers, eat your vitamins. I think people were tired of the hokiness of Hulk Hogan, but no one was asking for Hulk Hogan to become heel. They didn't know they wanted it until they got it, and then they only got it because of this defection. And that turn of Hulk Hogan turning heel, that's another one of those like, exactly. um, you know, if the aliens ever look at the ruins of civilization and find, you know, the history of professional wrestling, that is the moment that the aliens are gonna be like, holy fuck, can't believe yeah. they turn Hulk Hogan heel. Exactly. And I think I think you're right about the hokiness of Hulk Hogan and people didn't know what they wanted back then, but but they it's what they needed at the time. Mm. And it's still one of those ones. I remember the day it happened and it was it was the garbage. It yeah. was the garbage and the projectiles. And like you see, you always see that sign. Uh, I saw it at Clash. If Drew loses, we riot. And literally, I was terrified because I the way that crowd was, I thought it was going to be a riot. But in that instance, when Hulk Hogan dropped that leg on Savage, that crowd was ready to riot. Like, they were that annoyed, but you move further four, five, six years, and you're like, 
that just changed everything. Everything. Granted, it lasted a little too long with every single person on the roster being NWO. You might as well just call it WCW NWO. But for that time period, what they gave us with that heel turn was pure gold. And it shows what type of businessman Hulk Hogan was back then because he saw money. He saw money in that, and that's why he chose to be the third guy. Because it was supposed to be Sting. Mm -hmm. But Hogan was just like, no, 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 no. This is my gravy chain, and I'm jumping all over it. It's good for him. It's good Uh, for him. 100%. Now, um, we're not leaving WCW yet, because this is really where it all started, right? You know, you can make the the argument of the defections from from the territories, and... They weren't really defections. They were really more seen as poaching from Vince McMahon, you know, exactly. des- destroying the uh, and uh, asserting his his um, his genetic jackhammer all over the the, the territories. Uh, it, it, yeah, the the what, what does he call them? The the grapefruits. The grapefruits. <laughs> the grapefruits. <laughs> yeah. So uh-huh. the other one. So I want to transition into this one because we mentioned something. Uh, one extreme, right, where WCW almost put over WWE too much. And by putting them over too much, it made their roster look weak. So here's the opposite of that. The next one is Alundra Blaze, where, for those that don't know, Alundra Blaze came over to WCW with the WWE, WWF women's title. And on live television during her debut on Monday Night Nitro, she took the title and threw it in the trash. So they actually went the complete opposite where they buried all of her accomplishments in the WWF, making her debut on WCW feel significantly less special because now you're not bringing this badass who was a champion. Now you are creating the 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 illusion that you're actually bringing a chump who is beating losers that meant nothing over in the WWF. That's to me the story that you tell by trashing the title. So it's like two extremes, right? You put over yeah. the WWE too much and you bury the WWE too much. They needed a happy in-between medium that they just were never able to deliver properly. And the Alondra yeah. Blaze one was um shocking, but I think a terrible fucking decision. Absolutely. Um, And I remember watching a documentary with Bischoff and Alundra Blaze talking about how they decide to make this situation. And she's just like, well, I'm champion. What do you want me to do with the title? And he's like, bring it with you. And I think this was the issue with Eric Bischoff through all of WCW. Yes, a lot of his decisions were fantastic. And I am never going to shoot on Eric Bischoff because, well, at least he's not um, our favorite. What's his name? Um, Vince. Russo. Vince Russo. At least he's not Vince Russo. Anyways, but he made a lot of spontaneous decisions that now if you look back on them, you'd be like, did he really want to do that? You know what I mean? I think this is one of those ones where the women's division in WCW at the time was not good. Bringing over the women's champion from WWE, having her bury the division and not have anything to back it up with was a really poor decision. It made her look like a badass. Don't get me wrong. It's one of those images in, like you said, if the aliens come around, you're going to be like, whoa, like, I can't believe they did this. This is crazy, right? But then what did she follow up with, right? Like, was there anything? It was it was kind of a lackluster transition, but it's one of those ones that on this list we had to talk about, right? And it's kind it's, it's kind of funny because... It's a good precursor to, I think, a defection that we should move to next because we're still not leaving WCW. And I hate to take your job, but the Alundra Blaze situation brings us to halting that situation ever happening again with Bret Hart. And literally the biggest story from that timeline of the Montreal screw job. Brett didn't want to drop the title, but Brett is going to WCW. Vince has made this mistake once. He's not doing it again. 
Yeah, he was not and, gonna. He would die before he let Eric, would let Eric Bischoff have Brett trash the title. Exactly, and this is where the whole line of Brett screwed Brett comes out because Brett didn't want to do business. Yes, okay, he said he wanted to drop the title and relinquish on the Monday night in in, in Toronto or wherever it was going to be, but he didn't want to lose on Canadian soil, which I'm sorry, but that's not how this game works. And this is another, it's a big defection but I don't think the defection is the story here. It's the back end story that really affected both companies with Brett leaving. It it really skyrocketed the persona of Mr. McMahon. Everyone thinks Aust Stone Cold Steve Austin was the one that brought out Mr. McMahon. No. The this. Mr. McMahon character was created the night of the Montreal Screwjob. Because everyone else thought he was just a commentator. Right? Back then, again, I've gone back to this. We didn't have all the information we have now. So this whole one with Bret Hart, the story is not the defection to WCW. It's everything that happened precursor. Because let's be real. Brett's run in WCW shocking. Oh, it's forgettable. It, it's completely, absolutely forgettable. I think you're 100 percent right. Um, it's it's almost like um, uh, have you ever seen the butterfly effect or know what that is, Steve? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, this is such a butterfly effect situation where it, and it, it and you can say it all started with the outsiders thing, right? Um, where one domino fell and it caused everything to fall alongside it to the point where it led to the Alondra Blaze situation and that led to Vince McMahon no fucking way am I letting Brett walk away with the title Alondra Blaze doesn't do that and I guarantee you Vince puts his trust in Brett yes and, and, and I don't and I don't think it was a matter of Vince not trusting Brett it's a it was a matter of Vince not trusting Eric Bischoff and the way in the sleaziness and the things that Eric Bischoff was capable of thinking of if Eric Bischoff hadn't have thought of having Alundra Blaze do that, I don't think that Vince McMahon would have been as paranoid as he was to take that title off of Brett, and he would have allowed Brett to drop that title on Monday night. Maybe. Again, I'm telling myself stories, but if I'm in the situation of Vince McMahon, like I said, if I've seen this happen before, why am I going to let story rewrite itself again and let it happen again, right? No, I'm going to do everything in my power to prevent that from happening, not just to you know, any of my titles, but for sure to my most prized possession, I'm not going to let this happen again. Absolutely not. Had the had everything that led up to this moment not happened, we probably don't have the Montreal screw job. It's the old saying of fool me once, shame on me, fool me twice or fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. Yeah. That's that's what this is. And Vince had that in the back of his head that whole time during that negotiation with Brett, it was never happening. And I think this, this out of our whole topic of conversation, except for someone in, in the, in AW that we're going to talk about, this is going to give us the most comments in our video here, Santi, because I think the opinions of the wrestling community on this whole situation is split right down the middle. You and I have a bias because we are much more WWE fan, WWF fans, and we want to see our company succeed. But the WCW people and the people that are Bret Hart fans, sorry, Canada, I'm not a Bret Hart fan, but I think they're really going to push against this, that it was still Vince's fault and they're going to see this differently. So I hope the comments blow up on this because I, I can't wait. But Vince was never, bar none, never having Bret walk out of Montreal with that title. And there was like contingency plans in place just in case the first plan didn't go the way it was meant to happen. And maybe we can talk about that on another show. Maybe we could do an episode of the Montreal screw job. That would be pretty cool, but that was never happening. So that defection is huge because that was one of the ones that changed the landscape of the business, but for not the reason it should have, which I think is amazing. Because actually, that whole Montreal screw job actually saved WWE, I believe. 
Yeah, no, 100%. It's, it is, it really is the butterfly effect. One tiny little thing happened at some point years before that that led to the downfall of WCW. And it was all dominoes that fell, all these defections uh, that led to the Montreal Screwjob, that led to the creation of the Vince McMahon character, that led to the feud with him in Stone Cold Steve Austin. Game fucking over. It's the butterfly effect. And it's kind of just beautiful having the hindsight to be able to look back at all of the things that led to that. Um, yeah, let's let's move on from WCW because, um, you know, that's all we've been talking about here. And of course, you know, that was the age of defections. And now we're going to go into an era of wrestling that's more so um, in terms of defections and moves left and right. It's kind of like the dark ages. Yeah, there were people moving from WWE over to Impact, but it just it, it wasn't right. Like it was like the, the dust had settled from the Monday Night Wars and WWE was the kingpin and everyone else was just these tiny little minnows uh, it, trying to make it work in the in, in the world of professional wrestling. You have, uh, and luckily for TNA, they had a guy with a ton of experience leading them in Jeff Jarrett. That is literally the only reason why they were able to scrape and claw to get any sort of notoriety in the world that WWE was ruling. That being said, since... Since this particular defection, WWE has never lost as big a talent as this. I would say that this talent was, at the time, top three, top five in the business. In the height of his career, multi-time world champion, had another 10 years left in the tank, had a yep. great WWE career, and then went on to have a longer career with TNA, WWE lost Kurt Angle. And it's Mad. one of those maddening how tiny little TNA was able to wriggle away Kurt Angle, one of the most valuable prize talents that the WWE has arguably ever had. That yep. still blows my mind. And if you look back at the career of Kurt Angle, as much as we love him in WWE, his list of accomplishments and list of best matches he's had are over in TNA. So yeah. we lost five, six years of prime Kurt Angle who could have been having lights out fucking matches with John Cena's, with Undertaker. We only had such few matches between him and The Undertaker that it's, it's ludicrous. We only had one match between him and Shawn Michaels. The lack of matches with him in Triple H. We needed Listen, more man. him and Randy Orton. There's so many things that we were robbed from having. His, his best feud was Eddie. That's yeah. it. Like his his best matches in WWE, and this is this could be this could be a shoot, but or a hot take. His best his entire feud with Eddie was the really the best thing he did in WWE, except for his short comedies feud with Stone Cold. Other than that, if you want to talk talk matches. Like, he, he got to feud with Joe, he got to feud with Styles, and, I, and I'm talking not uh, mom hair Styles, I'm talking prime AJ Styles. Like, and that, those were some banger matches on, on almost week in and week out. So, really, like, you know more TNA than I really do, so I'm not going to go too far into this, I'm just going to say my piece. Losing Angle at that time in his career really put an emphasis on what WWE was doing at the time, and it wasn't really that good. And this is actually the time of the time where I kind of fell off of wrestling because, you know, the product was not amazing. And it clearly showed if you can lose the, your one of your top three guys to a, the minnow in the pond, it shows what was going on behind the scenes that wasn't good. That's my that's my only take on Kurt Angle leaving. Amazing matches by Kurt Angle, huge loss for WWE, and imagine what we could have gotten. Like wow. Yeah, and and Kurt Angle was really the blueprint. Like TNA and Kurt Angle really created the blueprint of kind of what AEW does really well nowadays, which is like, hey, let's send our talent over to other promotions and let's drape them with gold, right? They, yeah. Like this was really the first time that this happened with Kurt Angle. 
He was IWGP World Heavyweight Champion at the same time as being TNA World Champion. That's fucked. That's fucking ludicrous. I mean, granted, I, uh, New Japan wasn't as huge as it is now, but still, like, it, uh, I, New Japan at that time, you could make the argument was the second biggest organization in professional wrestling because uh, yeah. it was bigger than TNA. It just wasn't big was. here in in uh, here st stateside. Nowadays, you know, when it's commonplace to have AEW guys um, have matches with uh, with with New Japan guys and vice versa, there's no fucking way that New Japan allows the AEW champion to win the IWGP Heavyweight Championship. No fucking way. Not a chance. And vice versa. The AEW would never let uh, Okada or whoever is IWGP Heavyweight Champion win the AEW World Championship. Not a chance. Not a chance. But. New Japan and TNA both saw the value that they had with somebody like Kurt Angle still in the prime of his career that those two companies put his trust in him and they both were willingly willingly agreed to put their top prizes on the same guy. Yeah. That is mind blowing. It just goes to show again the level of talent that WWE let slip through their fingers. Yes, Kurt Angle with his time in WWE, dealing with a lot of neck issues, uh, broken freaking neck, of course, never let us forget that. Um, Percocet problems. Um, we, again, like it's it's these things that um, are those. Like Jeff Jarrett's wife. Yes, of course, all of that. <laughs> um, so I get why WWE maybe didn't want to resign him. Like I I I understand. But it had to be one of those situations where they thought that they were letting a low stock, like selling a low stock, only to see it, boom, catapult in, in, uh, in, in you know, you, you sold a stock at $2 only for to watch it immediately rise to $100, right? Like, that's yeah. what happened with WWE losing Kurt Angle. And it, it's unfortunate because, like I've already mentioned, it robbed us of so many potentially iconic matches that we could have had. Dude, we never got Kurt and Punk. We we could have had Kurt and Punk in 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 the WWE. Like it, it's it's so unfortunate to the point where you know once we finally got Kurt Angle home back in the WWE, like it was it it wasn't the same, right? Like it it's a, it, it was a guy who could barely like he couldn't even he can't look sideways. Kurt Angle can't look sideways. That's how many neck he problems walks, he has. And he and he still walks knee, bowed need as well. Yeah. So it's like. It like even last week or a couple of weeks ago when he was in Pittsburgh or a month ago now, sorry, a month ago when he was in Pittsburgh, he did. He was a shell of himself. Yeah. And so, you know, once it, TNA rinsed them for everything that they could get, understandably so, it's the biggest star that they've ever had in the business. Um, and they used them very well, admittedly. Like if you look back at the at the history of, of superstars that a that uh, TNA had, there were really four guys that they used really well. Kurt Angle, Bobby Lashley, AJ Styles, and Samoa Joe. They did yep. them all very, very well. Kurt Angle had a better career in TNA than he had in, a, in, in WWE. And that's crazy to think about. The fact, Just think about it. That short stint with the WWE was still a Hall of Fame worthy career. Of course it was. It's crazy. But I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this. He also was part, uh, helped create one of the greatest factions of all time in TNA that goes heavily unrecognized in the main event mafia. Yeah. Like unless you are a massive all-around wrestling fan you need to understand how good that faction was and i mean that 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 is up there in for me in my top five just because of just names recognition so tna did wonders with kurt angle and the fact that they wwe still acknowledged his short run to put him in the hall of fame it just shows how good he was and yeah. how big of a loss he really was to WWE. All right. Well, let's talk uh, some modern day losses because, of course, um, you know, um, we have two big boys in, in, in stateside nowadays with the WWE still, of course. And then we have AEW and AEW's entire business model seems to be to just raid WWE talent. Now, they really haven't been able to get their grips in their hands on major main roster talent. There's a couple that we're going to talk about. But for the most part, they've been taking a lot of guys um, from from NXT who, or, or, or guys who made the jump from NXT to the main roster that just didn't really see the, the, the same level of success that they were hoping to get 
you know, on the main roster that they had in in NXT. So we're talking guys like Adam Cole, um, um, uh, Keith, Alistair Black, uh, Alistair Black Keith Lee, uh, Ty Dillinger. The, we wouldn't really consider those like major losses of course a, a major wrestling fan like us we acknowledge adam cole as a major loss but yeah. the average wwe fan most of them didn't know who adam cole was you we need to realize that knowing nxt and knowing the the indie world we are like five percent of the wwe audience exactly so exactly. I, I, that's why we, we we're not going to talk about those guys so let's talk about the guys that are very recognizable let's just start with the top one the guy who um in my opinion th there's another guy who we can say is the one that put AEW on the map but i think this is the one that put AEW on the map as a true competitor to the wwe and that's john moxley aka dean ambrose yep so Kind of similar vibes to Kurt Angle in that WWE had this guy, had gold, didn't realize what they had, left him to waste, made him unhappy, he left, and now he's flourishing in AEW in all accounts, it's pointing that he's going to have a longer, more fruitful career in AEW than he's ever had in the WWE, exactly like Kurt Angle. Um, Kurt Angle was definitely treated better in terms of a main event talent uh, than, than Dean Ambrose was. Um, but Moxley is getting the Kurt Angle treatment that Kurt Angle got in Impact. Moxley's now getting it in AEW. Multi-time world champion. The coolest fucking entrance in professional wrestling at the moment, I would say. Um, yep. And, you know, aside from, you know, the very, very top guys in WWE, he's one of the most over uh, superstars on the planet. A guy who's who's not even in front of the millions and millions of people that regular WWE talent is on a on a weekly basis. Moxley is more over than them. Listen, Moxley come. There was something said in a promo a couple of weeks ago about Moxley being the number three guy in the Shield, being and granted one of the greatest factions of all time. That like I just spoke about with the main event Mafia. Moxley was not at that point in time the number three guy. Moxley has always been a top guy. WWE just went with what they're used to. He was not, Moxley was not cut from the same cloth. Dean Ambrose was that, the wild thing, the, the, that one thing that was sporadic, that he was, again, I hate using all his gimmick names, but they're, they all work for him. He was unhinged. He was a little loopy. And it wasn't, it did not fit the current WWE model. So they went with Roman and Seth. And Moxley was set, left by the wayside, unless it was extreme rules or something where they could really let him, you know, let the leash loose a little bit. Moxley is flourishing in his element in AEW. And that's why he is the number one guy. He went and worked on himself. He did what he needed to do to get himself healthy. And now Moxley will be champion because he's doing good business, both inside the ring and outside the ring. He's doing everything right. And arguably the number two or three guy on the planet in pro wrestling right now and the other two are his two fellow shield members seth is doing amazing creative stuff he doesn't need a title seth is basically Shawn michaels he didn't need a title to be successful and seth is doing his thing roman is on god mode so like he's untouchable and then you've got moxley who is doing the absolute same thing but showing up week in and week out going for that AEW title, and he's doing it in a way that is not the WWE way. It's his own way, and Tony Khan's being say, sure, just make me money. And he's doing that. He's doing that, and it's entertaining every time he comes out and is in front of the crowd. Like, you genuinely watch AEW to see Moxley right now. It's like watching WWF in the 90s to see Stone Cold and The Rock. Yeah. Like, it's the same yeah, so um, I, I don't know if, if this basketball reference will land with you. It'll land with 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 whoever watches the NBA that that's listening. Uh, the The Oklahoma City Thunder at one point in their young career had Kevin Durant, Russell Westbrook, and James Harden all on the same team, all on the same team. 
and just were never able to do anything with all three of them. It always seemed that they could only really get two of those guys to really become superstars. What happens? James Harden goes to, to Houston. Flourishes becomes an MVP. This is what's happening. Imagine, imagine if WWE was able to capitalize not just on the two member, two of the three members on the Shield, but if they were able to capitalize on three. Holy fuck! What WWE could have right now if they had these, dude, the main event scene of the WWE right now. If they were able to do half of what AEW has done with Moxley, if they were able to do that for Dean Ambrose, the roster, the WWE roster would be fucking untouchable. Un I'm sorry, touchable. Give me Karrion Cross versus Moxley or Dean Ambrose in like a Hell in a Cell match. I'm okay with it. Give me Drew versus Moxley just in a like a brawl or a street fight. I'll take it. Roman Seth Moxley or Dean Gunther. Ambrose. Gunther. God. Meat Slapper. Thank you. Still, by the way, the best match of Clash of the Castle. Just saying. But my back to what we're talking about. Moxley or Dean Ambrose, whatever you want to call him. At this stage in WWE, yes, he would have had to fight through all the bullshit, but under Triple H's regime, oh. Oh. we have war games on the main event coming up, Santi. Moxley in war games. Take our money. Take our goddamn money. Now, uh, let's move on to the next guy. Another guy that's in AEW, um, the first pillar of AEW, you could argue, the first big signing. Now, what's interesting is that they didn't sign this guy after he left WWE. He actually, he actually signed after leaving New Japan because WWE lost him to New Japan. He goes to New Japan, headlines the Tokyo Dome for Wrestle Kingdom, has feud of the year with Kenny Omega over there. Five star matches. And then goes on to arguably start AEW, Cody Rhodes, the elite and stuff. But like those guys did not carry the baggage. And I'm using baggage here as a good term, like the, the history that the Jericho brought to AEW because Their brand power was not big enough. They needed a big guy. And honestly, there was no bigger that you could get. Yeah. It's interesting to, it. cause like I think of Jericho, I was like, oh, well, that's like, like that is a WWE guy. Now, mind you, he's also been in WCW. I think like the only promotion he's never really been in is TNA. Um, but it still feels like it was, how do I say this? You know, we've listed a lot of guys here that were top talent of the WWE. Maybe I might be wrong here, but the sentiment I got when they were able to sign Jericho, they didn't take a top talent from WWE. They took a piece of the soul of WWE, a piece of, I, I, it's hard to put in the words, right? Like he, it, Jericho embodies a lot of what WWE has been and how, and he's evolved with the WWE for the past 20 years. And taking a guy like Jericho, you know, a guy who by all rights could just be anywhere he wanted and be successful. And yet somehow they managed to convince him to come to rinky dinky AEW when it was nothing. And he was able to see the future and understand that this could be the next big thing. First of all, congrats uh, to fucking Tony Khan on his salesmanship to sell Jericho on this. And it was a brilliant move for both parties. Nancy, you said you couldn't find the words uh, for it. I'm going to give you the words. Jericho said, fuck you to WWE. That's what he did. And d he could have come back to WWE. He could have retired. He could have stayed in Tokyo. But he basically said, I don't like how you do business. I'm going to go into business for myself. And it changed the landscape of what we know as pro wrestling now. And I think with some of the people that we've seen on this list that we've already talked about, they have fallen, followed those shoes. Zaraya for one of them. Zaraya, she was told, you got to drop your Twitch channel. And we won't, we're, we're really concerned about if you can compete. She basically said, nope, fuck you. I'll let my contract run out. I'm keeping my $780,000 a year I make on Twitch. And I'm still going to go do the thing I love when I'm ready and able. 
So did, so did, uh, sorry, Adam Cole. So did Keith Lee. Obviously, they've not flourished as much as we'd like them to. But Jericho was kind of that blueprint of these defections from WWE to another competitor. We can call them a competitor now. But really, if it wasn't for Jericho, I don't think we would have seen the confidence in AEW that people have hundred percent a hundred percent if i am um you know we we've talked about how um the the great treatment of cody rhodes will encourage AEW talent to make the jump to wwe well AEW started it with the great treatment of jericho the great treatment of of moxley that is what set the the red carpet for WWE guys like Cesaro, like William Regal, and all of those NXT guys that we've mentioned, like Soraya, um, making the leap over with confidence. Again, some of them got fucked, like Aleister Black, but that happens, you know? When you, it, not everybody can be in the main event, not everybody can have TV time. So like, I, I, I get what's happening there. Um, but yeah, Jericho was the blueprint to give everyone confidence that, Oh my God, I don't need to swallow the bullshit from WWE. I can make a living somewhere else. I'm the revival. I, we don't have to shave each other's backs to make money. We can yeah. go do the shit that we're actually really good at and go do it yeah. over there and do it yeah. in a manner that it's respected. I don't think that if it wasn't for the way they treated guys like Jericho and guys like Moxley, that those guys come over. I really don't. I really don't. No, so I don't I, I I agree with you and and that's that's why I said it because if listen, if you're looking at the likes of well, we're looking at it right now with the whole MJF situation. Yes, he's extended his contract. But the treatment that Cody Rhodes was given. And granted, MJF is a big name. Yes, he's not done a lot, but he's a very big name in the business right now. And if he is able to keep building his brand for another year and a bit, he's going to get the same red carpet welcome from AEW to WWE, you know? And again, I think WWE is starting to see that too, because what they did with Jericho, okay, yes, AEW has pulled a lot of small minnows out of NXT that are just kind of filling the roster. Um, I don't want to be rude to Bobby Fish, but he's the first one that kind of pops into my mind and ty dillinger's another one but really like they wwe need, has needed to change their dynamic because of what they're seeing AEW doing with the big guys they've posted and people being like oh you know i feel you and this is more attractive now and tony khan is also paying massive wages massive wages to people that don't deserve it it, it, it's definitely interesting uh, comparing this age of defections compared to the WCW age yeah. of defections. Um, you know, the, things legally are are so much more ironclad than they were back then. You know, Rick Rude, the Rick Rude situation is not going to happen nowadays. I think the silliest situation that we've seen is Aleister Black and not being 90 days, only being 30 days. Um, that actually ended up being like a really cool thing for wrestling fans because no one was expecting that debut, correct? So yeah. um, it, it seems like now, you know, back then people were um, purely making the move for dollars. Yes. Right. Hey, here's Ted Turner with the big fat dick of a check. Um, what are you making in WWE? Don't fucking tell me. I'll triple it, right? Here nowadays, it's not necessarily that people are looking for more money. They are looking for greener grass. Yep. They, and, I, and, I agree. And there was the, the quote from CM Punk, as, as, as grouchy as he's been, there's a really good quote from him. You know, the grass isn't necessarily greener on the other side. It's greener where you, where you water it, right? Where you make it greener. Um, and, and you know, the... Tony Khan has set a, a good precedent that the grass can be greener, but we've seen with guys like Aleister Black that it's not the case. So it's interesting that it, it's changed from uh, I'm chasing the money to now, hey, I'm chasing a better work environment and, yeah. um, and I'm chasing wanting to enjoy what I do more, um, you know, actually enjoy wrestling. And I think that just also goes with the type of performer that we have back then we had um, a lot of showmanship a lot of big guys that be that 
wrestling wasn't really like their life and blood. They kind of just ran into it because they had the look, right? Undertaker yeah. wasn't trying to be a wrestler. He was trying to be a basketball player, right? Like that was, that's the, that's the story of so many WWE Kevin and WWE. Nash was just a bouncer. All, so many of them. Meanwhile, now we have people who um, watch the product as a kid who have grown up have put in the time in the indies and they've been wrestlers since they were 16 and this is what they want to do so now they're chasing passion as opposed to purely chasing the dollar i promise you that wwe offer more money to cesaro than aew offer to cesaro i promise you i promise you that wwe offer more money to keith lee than aew offered keith lee it's just that now the defections come from a place of passion rather than a place of um well what are you gonna fucking pay me I'm sure it still exists, but I like this a lot more. I, I really genuinely love that that the talent has so many more options. Um, and it doesn't even have to be AW. It could be New Japan. It could be Impact. And there's so many great places where wrestlers can now make a living. It do, You don't have to be pigeonholed to one particular place. And we're going to continue to see these quote-unquote defections. And these defections are good for the business it's good for the wrestler and it's good for fans overall, honestly. It's it's finally it's finally about the wrestling and not about the paycheck and the open like stay at home contract that we had in the nineties that Ted Turner the guaranteed money. Yeah. You know, yeah. like the guaranteed money contract is what I think ruined WCW. Yeah. Now know? it's yeah. you know, you're coming here and you're working. Yeah. That's what it is. And you're expected to put on a good match. And like from a lot of these people like Moxley, you can see he's genuinely enjoying his work and he's putting on great matches. Moxley is not overly the best in ring performer, but he's putting on great matches. Yeah. So it is what it is. It is what it is. All right, Steve, let's wrap it up here. Um, where can the people find you? Uh, Twitch.tv slash Mr. Tesh. Link is in the bio below. Guys, I am been off for a little while so i am starting up uh hopefully if this video is posted this friday and i will be streaming for the next uh couple of months four to five days a week so a lot of wwe a lot of call of duty so santi what about you uh twitch.tv slash santi zap you can find me at my personal tiktok as well it's, uh, mr santi zap and of course over on straight shoot uh tiktok at straight shoot um thank you very much for watching if you are watching this on youtube uh please consider leaving a uh, like on this video if you are listening on podcast services please uh leave us a review if it is possible and of course support the sponsors bat whackers all of their links will be down in the description below and all the details to um getting their promotions will be at the start of the video in case you missed it and or the, at the start of the audio thank you very much for watching take care and we'll see you next week